Hello and welcome back to The Savvy Psychologist. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and every week I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. So today we are all in for a real treat. We're here today with none other than Lewis Howes, who is a New York Times bestselling author of the hit book, The School of Greatness, and author of the new book, The Mask of Masculinity. He's a lifestyle entrepreneur, high-performance business coach, and keynote speaker. A former professional football player and two-sport All-American, he is currently a USA men's national handball team athlete. And as all of you podcast listeners out there likely know, he hosts a top 100 iTunes-ranked podcast, The School of Greatness, which has over 35 million downloads and 500 episodes since it launched in 2013. Lewis was recognized by the White House and President Obama as one of the top 100 entrepreneurs in the country under 30, and Details Magazine called him one of five internet gurus that can make you rich. Lewis is a contributing writer for Entrepreneur and has been featured on Ellen, The Today Show, The New York Times, People, Forbes, and a zillion other major media outlets. Lewis, welcome to the show and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So your newest book is titled The Mask of Masculinity, How Men Can Embrace Vulnerability, Create Strong Relationships, and Live Their Fullest Lives. And so this was a surprising topic to many people, <laughs> especially you know, coming from a former professional football player. So why, yep. why start a conversation about masculine vulnerability? Because it's the most important thing in our world right now. And not many white male jock men are talking about these topics openly and expressing their opinions and talking about being raped as a kid by a man they didn't know and talking about the insecurities, the pressures, the, the fears, the vulnerabilities that most men think they're not allowed to talk about because it's been conditioned, as you know, in school and sports and society and media from the top down with politics that it's not okay to show emotion. It's not okay to reveal the things that have happened to you in the past because that makes you a weak human being. That makes you less than a man. That makes you any type of name that kids are called all the time. Uh, in school for doing anything that is compassionate, giving, caring, empathetic at all. And uh, that type of conditioning uh, is hard to break in men, uh, I think for anyone, especially if it's something that they've faced for decades. And for me, at 30, um, when I finally opened up about being sexually abused for the first time, when every single day was on my mind and a lot of my decisions were reactions based on feeling taken advantage of, feeling abused, feeling made fun of constantly. And so I built my persona up to fit in and to be accepted and to be loved and liked by people as opposed to feeling the sense of abandonment or abuse or um, taking advantage of me. And um, the when I started to talk about this four years ago on my podcast and open up about it, I first started talking about it with my family one by one, then friends, which both were terrifying in their own way, because what if they don't accept me anymore? I I was heavily encouraged to talk about it openly and publicly on my podcast. And I was terrified to do that because, you know, what if my audience didn't accept me anymore? But when I did, I found it, it was the most popular episode I'd ever done. And more than just popularity, it was the most impactful thing I'd ever done talking about this based on the reactions of hundreds of men who emailed me and said, thank you for giving me permission to tell my wife. I've been married for 20 years. She doesn't know what happened to me. My kids don't know. My, you know, my family doesn't know my, whoever my friends don't know because I've been terrified and I feel like I've been living in a prison in my heart my entire life because of these things that I'm not able to share. Then I started to reach to dive into the research. I was like, okay, well, this is just my uneducated theory from my own personal experience. So let me dive into this more. And I started doing a lot more research. Uh, and psychologists have been studying this for decades about development with boys in school, uh, to teen boys, to to adult men, to prison men, men who are in prison. These are outlets, and when our energy is manifested internalized and we're not able to express ourselves in healthier forms because that is 
deemed less of a man for whatever reason, then it manifests in other ways. And these masks, what I like to call these masks, uh, these masks of masculinity that help us fit into society to be accepted, to be loved, and to belong. And uh, the challenge is when we are constantly putting on a mask, we're never our truest selves. And therefore, we resent ourselves even more and we resent the people around us because they're not accepting us for who we are and we're not even showing who we are to them. It's really challenging because we want to belong. As you know, as a psychologist, we want to belong. We want to fit in. We mm -hmm. want to be accepted. I went on this book tour uh, in the last couple of months and I just started asking questions. There's about 50-50 men and women who are at these events. And I started asking questions. I say, show a hands of the women in the room. And this was all over the country, so different parts of the country. So show a hands of the women in the room who – you have girlfriends, other girlfriends, where you get together at least once a week, whether in person or on the phone, and you talk about the things that you're going through, your challenges, your fears, your insecurities, your relationship issues, your body image issues, your work issues, anything like that. How many of you get together at least once a week, and I'm assuming some of you do this every single day, go ahead and raise your hand. Every woman in the room raise their hand. Maybe one woman out of all the events didn't raise their hand. Almost every woman raised their hand. Yes, this is a weekly thing. And most of them were saying, we do this every day. We get together for lunch and we talk about these things every day. And then I go, okay, show a hands to the men that you get together once a month in groups and you talk about your fears and your insecurities and your relationship issues and your body image issues and all these challenges at work where you talk about these things and you look in each other's eyes and you express them. And maybe two or three each event out of the hundreds of men would raise their hand doing that once a month. And now these are the progressive guys who have like men's groups and church groups and things like that where they're coming together to talk about these topics. And they do it once a month as like a planned event. Now, it's just not really acceptable to do this on a daily basis from my personal experience and a lot of the experiences of men that I've interacted with and heard from at least in America. And when I start to talk to people internationally, a lot of people are the same way internationally on this definition and sense of what masculinity is. And so in the book and also in your life, you're, you're really walking the walk of, of masculine vulnerability. And so I'm really glad that you brought up your, your sexual abuse experience and the, the reaction that you've gotten from that. And so as you open up, so you've talked to your family, you've talked to your friends, you've talked to your aunts, and, and you discovered, so a number of surprising things happened. And so what, I'll, I'll let you tell that story. What, what happened? Yeah, well, I was terrified at first. And, um, because I think all we want to do is belong and be accepted and fit in. And so I was terrified at first. And I remember talking to a therapist friend of mine who I was just trying to get feedback from. I felt like it was a safe space to talk to her about it. And I said, I'm really terrified to tell my family. I don't think I can. And she said, well, if you don't think you can, then that's going to have power over you, that feeling constantly. If you don't feel like you can tell people, then you're still living in fear. And I was like, okay, I know I need to, but how do you set this up? How do you drop a bomb on someone that you care about in your family and you don't want them to get upset or hurt? And she said, ask them this question first. Is there anything that I could ever do or say that would make you not love me? And by asking that question first, before I told them, mm -hmm. I, was, I was able to gauge a reaction and response of their level of acceptance of me. And every one of them was like, absolutely not. There's nothing you can do that would make me or say that would make me not love you. And so it gave me that sense of peace of like, okay, they're going to accept me no matter what I've been through, what I've done. And asking my brother, he had been to prison for four and a half years when I was a, a kid, when I was eight years old to 12. And so asking him, he was like, absolutely not. You know, because he, like <laughs> he had like the most shame and guilt because he, he was in this – Experience. He'd sold drugs uh, to an undercover cop, unfortunately, when he was 18 and made a mistake. And they sentenced him for a long time, but he got out in four years in good behavior. And this was like 20 years ago. So he was like, absolutely not. And so that gave me a sense of peace of like, okay, not just dropping it on them, but like making sure I'm assured that they're going to accept me. And if they say, well, it depends what you do, then maybe I don't tell them right then. Mm. Or maybe I like set it up in a different way and say, you know, I really want to know that I can share some things where I don't feel like you're going to judge me or shun me from the family. And I've 
you know, been through some stuff that's I've been holding on to for a long time and something did something to me and I want to share it. So I think it's all about how you set it up and the context and what you're talking about. Now it's challenging because a lot of these people I've talked to, it's crazy because everywhere I go, people open up to me now and they say, I've never told anyone this, mm. but I was sexually abused. I was raped. I was this. And here's what happened for whatever reason, since I open up and am vulnerable and just so revealing, it's like people automatically trust me. And this is what happened with my family. Like they, they started opening up and sharing things that I'd never heard about them because I led with vulnerability. And that's a really hard thing to do. Okay, so Lewis, when you disclosed, not only did the people you opened up to continue to love you, to continue to want you around, trust you, like even trust you more, they also opened up to you. And, and so, oh, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And so, but I mean, on, on this podcast, we always bring it back to the science. And so it, it's been shown that intimacy, so getting closer to someone is, is driven by reciprocity. So like you share some part of your innermost life with me, like I'll share some part of my innermost life with you. So, but to start that reciprocal process, I think you bring up a good point. Like you had to take that first step and it, it took, like you said, you were terrified. You had to overcome a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation in order to disclose. So how, like in the moment, how do you do that? I, I really like your thought of setting it up by asking, is there anything I could ever do to make you not love me? Do, yep. do you have other tips or ideas for our listeners who are ready <laughs> to be brave, ready to be vulnerable? Yeah. What, what can they do? I think that was good for my family. I don't know if I would say that to like my friends. Sure. Um, um, so I think you got to understand who the person is, the context. You know, my girlfriend, yes, I'd say that to her. But if it was like a, a guy friend of mine who has never opened up to me and never shown – and like if I put my arm around right. him, he like that would match. me off. Sure. Yeah, it would be like, okay, bro, like <laughs> you know, you've got you've to understand your audience and meet people where they're at. And so I would say – you know, there's some things that, that people did to me in my past that I'm really ashamed of and feel guilty and insecure about. And I wanted to know if you'd be open to listening to me mm, mm -hmm. without judging me and without making me wrong or making me feel bad about it. And if it's not something you're you're ready to hear, I'm complete it's completely okay. But I want to let you know that I really want to share it with you and a lot of other friends that I have because I feel like it's gonna hold me back unless others know about it. So I imagine the first time you did that was probably the most terrifying. But something happens that I've, we will talk about on this podcast a lot is that the more often you do something, the more you own it, the easier it gets. And I wonder if that was true for you. Absolutely. I mean, it, it from the first times where my heart is palpitating and my lip is quivering and I'm like stuttering and looking down at the ground and not looking in their eyes because I'm humiliated and ashamed to – more and more friends and family are like, we love you. We accept you. It's okay. And more so, you know, a fraction of them saying, you know, I've been through that as well. Mm -hmm. And when they've mm -hmm. been through something similar experience, you ultimately have a deeper sense of connection and bond. It's like you've taken your relationship to a whole other level when you shared a common experience of something of that magnitude. And so there's just automatically a deeper understanding and connection from that point moving forward where you're both able to share and open up and trust each other more. And that's a beautiful thing. If we're living in anxiety constantly, that's just a challenging inner world to live in. So, well, here's, here's a question. So women also live in anxiety and feel inadequate or unlovable, uh -huh. but it's not tied to gender necessarily. Like it's not, it doesn't threaten our femininity, but why? Like why is this perceived huh. inadequacy in men so closely tied question. to masculinity? I mean, you're the psychologist, you probably know better <laughs> than I do, but I think it's just the conditioning of what it means to be a man from early childhood where anytime, you know, I was crying probably more than any other girl in, you know, kindergarten, preschool. I cried all the time as a young boy. Like I was constantly emotional, constantly crying. And then at some point someone was like, what are you a cry baby? Don't be a little girl mm. or whatever, or whatever they said, right? Don't be a little girl. Don't be a little cry baby man up, whatever. Like, I can't remember all this stuff, but it's just like, at some point you're like, oh, that's not acceptable. I want to fit in and want to have friends. So I can't be that way. So let me, next time I feel pain, let me not show it. Otherwise I'm not accepted and fit and I won't fit into class or into sports or in the music class or whatever it is. 
And um, showing pain is just, incompatible with my gender. If you're told to, you know, exactly, told to man up. Exactly. Or, yeah. Okay. And so you're just made fun of by the other boys or by other girls. You know, men are human beings as well. They're not just like rocks, solid, no emotions. They're human beings with a lot of sensitivities that they've masked for years. So to wrap up, I have a question about a different topic, about habits. And so your plan of action, you know, for writing books, for launching School of Greatness, for starting businesses, is known for being simple. You you emphasize discipline, execution, you set a goal, and you crank through it. So like even the boring, you know, unglamorous tasks, you, you just crank through and achieve it. So what do you do on the days where you just don't feel like pushing things forward? So like, how, how do you motivate? And how can our listeners motivate on the days they don't feel like being disciplined? planned? I think about my vision. I think about my vision and I think about that this could be my last day. Hmm. And I really connect to, okay, if this is my last day, would I be happy with myself for being lazy? Would I be happy that I'm in a rut and that I wasted the potential to share something with the world that could potentially make an impact on one person's life and help them in some area of their life? It doesn't have to be as drastic as saving their life, but something to improve humanity. And if, let's say, I am going to die today, and there's a moment where I get to look at myself and ask, did you give everything you've got? Or is there any regrets? I don't want to look at myself and be like, you know what? I wish I would have given a shot here. I wish I would have just finished it. I wish I would have just done that. I think a lot of us are afraid to put something out or complete something because it's not perfect Mm -hmm. or it needs to be a certain way or it needs to be perfect. I look at it as I just would rather not die and not do anything and I'd rather be put something out there that is, you know, I'm 98% complete Mm -hmm. that is going to still make a massive impact. And if it has a couple little mistakes here and there, then I can update it later. So, Louis, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your thoughts and for being here today. I appreciate you very much. Lewis Howes is the host of the excellent School of Greatness podcast and author of the New York Times bestselling book of the same name. His newest book is called The Mask of Masculinity, and you can pick up a copy at your favorite place to buy books. As always, thank you so much for making The Savvy Psychologist a part of your life. Never miss an episode when you sign up for the newsletter at quickanddirtytips.com slash newsletters or subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. You can like on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at QDT Savvy Psych, or follow me at Ellen Hendrickson. And check out ellenhendrickson.com for free, helpful resources to beat social anxiety and be your true self. This week, you'll find an exclusive interview with author Sophia Dembling on how to party like an introvert. Talking with her was useful and insightful. I learned a lot, and you will too. So check it out at ellenhendrickson.com. As always, The Savvy Psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and doesn't substitute for mental health care from a licensed professional. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next Friday for a happier, healthier mind.